and I said, hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to the O-Culture Podcast. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Thanks for being here during this most festive time of year, fresh off the winter solstice and a full moon and on the doorstep of the Christmas holiday. Hope you're all having a merry old fucking time with whatever you're celebrating, however you're celebrating, or if you're even celebrating at all. Some of you don't. That's cool. But it is with such seasonal celebrations in mind that we welcome back the one and only Dr. Al Cummins. Al, of course, is a professional diviner and historian, as well as a poet and consultant of all things magical. He was here not too long ago, back at the beginning of October, in episode 105, where we talked about geomancy, cartomancy, and other forbidden arts. And what a great companion piece that is to this chat that you are about to hear. Al and I are going to rap about a book he published earlier this year called A Book of the Magi, Lore, Prayers, and Spellcraft of the Three Holy Kings. And in the Patreon extension, we'll also get into one of those other forbidden arts, necromancy, particularly as it was practiced in 17th century England, which is a period Al has a serious fetish for. And after this, I hope you will too. One note on the chat, a couple Skype dropouts, which I did not notice live, but nothing too detrimental to the quality of the audio or the conversation, which is, I think, a rather jolly one. So put away that Yule log and spike some of that eggnog, because Dr. Al Cummins, the good doctor, is in the house right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Dr. Al Cummins, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for being interested in a return voyage here. Oh, bless you. Thank you for having me. Um, you always make me feel very, very welcome, Ryan. It's, uh, it's nice to hear your voice. Oh, thank you, man. It's the least I can do, too. So, you know, Dr. Al, tis the season for a chat about the Magi. Tis indeed. Yeah. Tis indeed. And earlier this year, uh, you actually published a book of the Magi, Lore, Prayers, and Spellcraft of the Three Holy Kings, which I cannot wait to get into. So why wait? Let's get into it. And what better <laughs> way to begin than with a quote at the beginning of the book? You wrote that it may at first seem a little ridiculous or perhaps even somewhat contrarian to suggest there is a magical, indeed necromantic value to a familiar Christmas trope. But I would remind you how much a very big deal the Three Kings play in Hispanic culture. Not simply in the parades and processions, or the foodways and festivities, but in customs, in identity, and in pride. This is not to compare what I am attempting to explore in this text and the centuries of the history of Christendom and colonialism that led to this, but merely to point out the Three Kings are already deeply magical to many, many peoples around the world. End quote. So my question, Dr. Al, is what is the reputation of these three characters across the world, and how did they get it? It's a, it's a great starting question. So certainly growing up in the UK, the, the Magi were, you know, a stock character of, um, of nativity plays in infants and junior school. I'm sure that's, that's kind of a, a familiar introduction to them for many of us in the Anglosphere, you know, um, tea towels on the head and you, you might play a, a character with some lines. You might be a, a sheep at the back of the crash scene. Their reputation is is varied around the world. There are many traces of their 
medieval cultus, which was huge and hopefully we can get into as patrons of not just a particular pilgrimage, but all pilgrimages and all pilgrims, all travelers, the first three people to come and uh, and witness the, the the birth of the of the Son of God. Uh, although obviously at the at the time, and maybe we'll get into this, we can argue that they they're in fact doing a kind of political diplomatic mission to go and meet a new king. Uh, the the idea of his of his Majesty is far more emphasized than. Uh, his divinity, uh, for instance. Uh, again, so we can get a little bit in the weeds of Christological stuff, but the the Magi turn up in a in a variety of settings. Uh, the most famous feast of theirs is obviously Epiphany, the sixth of of January, which is Twelfth Night. So again, the Anglosphere has stuff around taking decorations down by then, but there's also an awful lot of traditions around feasting together. Uh, a cake or bread of some kind is 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 often a common feature across different cultural engagements with the with the magi that cake often has a a token a bean even a a ceramic little baby jesus that uh, that elects the king or queen of the festivities in some traditions that king or queen then has the responsibility to host the next party at candlemas there are a variety of other traditions around that so they they have this reputation as gift bringers as well in um in many uh, Latin American and Hispanic uh, communities. Epiphany, uh, the the day of the the three magi is the, well, the three kings is the the day that kids get their presents. You know, they might get one or two on Christmas, but most of it comes in the form of of the kings coming. And so, in 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 some communities and traditions, the kings are left food and drink, and their camels are left hay, very much like you know kids leave uh, Santa or Father Christmas. You know, mince pies and, and a glass of sherry and a carrot for the reindeer. Uh, I have a friend who, who, who you know, talks very uh, fondly about having uh, looked for hay and not been able to find it, and so dried out grass and put that in a shoebox under his bed for the magi and their camels. So they they're gift bringers. They're also they have a long tradition of being resorted to to justify astrology uh, as well. That they have perceived a star and that this star that guides them to the the sun of the light in the darkness of midwinter is a you know is, is a powerful trope. And so it's one that's been resorted to as the, you know, as the, the superhero origin story of Christianity itself. And so justified through those terms. Uh, they're also, you know, they have reputations with their own names, although they're far more almost exclusively appealed to as a collectivity, as, a, as an awesome, you know, a three piece than they are separately, although they, they have names. And to an extent, particularly through the writings of, say, pseudo bead, they have uh, a little bit of a, of a character of their own as well. And certainly the, the, the wider hagiographies from the 14th century onwards have them going off after they've uh, returned home via a different route, as uh, Matthew 2, 12 has it. And they, they go off and have their own adventures as well. And so there's kind of uh, like the, the, the extended apocryphal fandom stories about the things they get up to uh, separately a little bit as well. So there's a there's a sort of broad introduction to them. And then specifically what I was interested in is where they cropped up in folk magic and in the Grimoric record, where they have a patronage over some specific operations, such as a variety of spells and workings for uh, either safe travel or not tiring while traveling, again, emphasizing their patronage of pilgrims and travelers of various sorts. They also are appealed to as some of the first magicians that uh, a good Christian magician of the 16th and 17th century might appeal to in a kind of lineage in the same way that they would appeal to, or maybe not exactly the same, but in manners that are interesting to compare to, appeal to Solomon, right? And the Solomonic tradition that one may be working in, uh, along with appeals to Cyprian and and other famous and semi-mythical magicians. And so that's, that's one of the particular foci of my own devotion to them, is as a, a locus about which to commune and and learn from and work with uh, dead magicians well that answer is a great introduction to the chat actually because we're probably going to talk about everything that you just said at length at some point <laughs> but the, you know the first thing i wanted to touch on though was that you mentioned their uh you call it their triplicity in the book mm -hmm. you said they're generally referred to really only as a group by this threesome here but yeah. they are individuals and they do have proper names. What are their names and where did they come from? 
their names generally, and there are there are a couple of, uh, of takes on this. Uh, there are there are specific Persian names that are different, but the most popular ones, and certainly the ones that are founded in their cultic center of Cologne, where they become known as the Three Kings of Cologne eventually. Their three names are Casper, which is sometimes also spelled Jasper or even Gaspar in some cases, Balthazar, and Melchior. And from the writings of Pseudobede, they start to develop a character based off the fact that some of the earliest depictions of them are as three kind of identical figures with wearing Phrygian caps, which is an interesting you know, nod to Roman Saturnalia rites. But they, they look pretty much the same. Then gradually artists start to depict them as, the, as three stages of, of human life. So there's a young one, clean shaven. There's a, a middle-aged one with a bit of a beard. And then there's an old one with a long beard. And it's, it's at least pseudo-bead that starts to give them their their character as, you know, one of them is older, one of them is, is middle-aged. Typically, Casper is said to be the youngest, uh, often a beardless youth. Balthazar is middle-aged. And from the 15th century onwards, uh, increasingly starts to be identified as an African king. Uh, and then Melchior is, the, is usually regarded as the oldest. Now, as to which gifts they hold, this varies a great deal. And there are a lot of different charms and traditions that say which was holding which. There where you start to get into regional specificities of their, I guess you could say, cult eye at that point, but also uh, just the kind of literary traditions as well. We know very little about them via their actual scriptural basis. Uh, for instance, there's nothing in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, which is their their entire little cycle of, the, of their, their part in the nativity story. There's nowhere that it says there's three of them, for instance. We, we say there are three because... Um, there are three gifts, so it's presumed that there must have been three people holding them. But there are still Eastern Orthodox Christian traditions that hold there are 12 Magi. And so I'm not saying this to say that, you know, these newfangled traditions from the 5th century onwards aren't true to the, the pure spirit of the Magi. Quite the reverse, I'm saying, is, is these kind of living and, and, and engaging spirits, they, they start to accrue more qualities uh, over time from their bones being translated to Cologne from Milan to the, the, the change of their cultures to different traditions uh, arising, which have great, you know, socio-political implications as well, which we can hopefully get into at some point. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I am curious, though, you know, when we're talking about them as kings, are we talking about them as kings in the modern sense of the word? Is that a political title or is that some other sort of title? Yes. <laughs> so we can, we can talk about it a couple of ways. So the, the translation from the 1609 Vulgate English Bible, for instance, translates the word as wise men, uh, one word. We can, we can talk about Persian uh, etymologies of magi and magos and things like that, but they are certainly known as kings from at least mm, the mid-6th century. We have records left by Abbot Caesarius of uh, Arles, who calls them the three kings and certainly their names uh, we, we have from the roughly the sixth century as well but they don't start to be more actively used until the the, the tenth so they're kings in the sense that they are yeah they're regarded as the leaders of these disparate foreign lands and that's that's a crucial element to them as well they are they're all foreign they're all they're all from somewhere else and they gather together uh, in some accounts, such as, say, I'm a particular fan of John of Hildesheim's Historia, the, his history of, the, of the, the Three Kings, which is a 14th century hagiography of them, uh, where they meet at a, where three roads meet at a trivia outside Jerusalem and then progress together to, to Bethlehem. I like that because it, it highlights that there is this folkloric component of them being associated with crossroads and especially three part crossroads, uh, which is, is, is ritually very useful to know and work with. Yeah, you have a, a quote here, actually, about crossroads, too. You say, uh, the Magi are important scriptural exemplars of both Christian and pagan knowledge, authority, and power, even more so than St. Cyprian, uh, whose crux at the crossroads places his pagan sorcery firmly behind him. The Magi are both enlightened and heathen, simultaneously amongst the most elite of pagan sorcerers and the very first followers of the light that announces the Son of God. So, yeah. you call them both enlightened and heathen. Could you parse that out for us? How do they qualify as both? Well, this is uh, one of the fascinating components of where their status as foreign kings who have bowed to the Christ child comes in, because this is utilized both in 
colonial expansion into the so-called New World and also affords those same colonized people uh, an identity and a, an ancestralized form of power. So the way this works is that very often a, an expanding colonial power will take over and in the course of Christianizing, it will say, you foreigners had a king and he was one of the three magi. He was one of the three kings. And so you're all already Christian. You just forgot. <laughs> right. So this is done explicitly in Central America with what gets called pre-conquest evangelism. You know, Christian missionaries and soldiers and conquistadors go over there and they find, you know, these uh, ornate and uh, detailed civilizations of the, of the Mayans and, and Olmecs and, and other cultures and civilizations. And the only way they can resolve the idea that these heathens could possibly have had such advanced civilizations is that they must have been Christian and then forgot about it. And so this is a this is a profound endeavor because it says you had a king, but also your king has already bowed to the king of kings that we're bringing to you. And now you're Christians. You're not just Christians now, but you're being reminded that you've been Christians for a very, very long time. It, one could argue, and I, I kind of go this route, that that is a form of colonizing someone's dead as well as their living. The flip side of this is that once these you know colonized and occasionally fully enslaved peoples are told, you know, you had a king, that they take that on, that they recognize that they had this authority and that they met, there are many peasant and servant and slave uprisings and revolts that revolve around Epiphany and the night before Epiphany are people declaring themselves kings, donning the, the, the guising themselves as kings and then taking to the streets and demanding redistribution. Now, this itself is based on two concepts that start to emerge in the late medieval period, arguably. So we don't get that expansion into the, again, the quote unquote new world of the Americas until, you know, the early modern period. But there is a shift in the mid to late uh, medieval period of talking about the kings as gift givers and gift receivers. So there are two elements to this. One is tithing. Many kings and uh, royal courts start to use epiphany as a date by which just as the magi or the kings gave gifts to to the Nazarene, so they, as Christ's representatives on earth, you know, fully pulling that divine right stuff, will ask for gifts from the gentry and from everyone underneath them, right? So their subordinates, i.e. everyone else, gets to play the part of the magi, and they get to play the part of the Christ child receiving these, uh, these gifts, these tributes, these tithes, these taxes, right? So on the one hand, there's the notion of of this being a consolidation of power. But on the other hand, their underlings are now identified as kings and can thus claim that, that authority as well in, in, in their own way as linked to the Magi in a variety of perspectives. And I'm happy to talk about some of the particularities of what that looks like. But the other half of it is, is arms, is the, if there's this tradition of epiphany being about receiving gifts, then people start, you know, poor folks start dressing up as kings and guising and doing a variety of like caroling type things that become the, the star singer tradition that I'm, I'm happy to talk about. But they, they start using it as a way of begging for arms. And that itself is not too far from starting to not just ask, but demand for certain kinds of redistribution. So my point is that there's this insider and outsider thing. There's this consolidation of power by claiming that, you know, all these foreign people have already agreed to the rise of uh, and, and expansion and colonization in some cases of Christendom. But they're also devolving that power and, and, and decentralizing it by saying also these people are, are wise major. And so that's part of how I approach this notion of both heathen and enlightened. Yeah. And I was always curious, too, if we should look at these as maybe composite characters of some sort. Have you considered this? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, there are there are definitely traditions where they're from specific places. There are plenty of examples of one king is African, one king is quote unquote Indian, which to the medieval mindset means something slightly different to what we now call India. And one of them is sometimes uh, from somewhere else is sometimes European as well. But that changes depending on how they're being deployed by uh, expanding Christendom, right? When they're encountering indigenous peoples. So yeah, there's that composite sense of like they're foreign and you can insert which specific land they're from. But the, the idea of them coming together is also central to their, their, their ritual role, right? Of, of, disparate creeds and and magicians and leaders and, and and wise men coming together with a common goal in mind 
and, and following a star together. So that sense of cooperation and their power through their plurality and their, and their differences that they, they come to to share knowledge and to uh, expand it and to cross fertilize it is really fascinating to me. And I think, um, I think a, a, a very beautiful thing. Yeah, and you mentioned the Epiphany, and I want to talk about that. It's also called Three Kings Day, the Feast of the Kings. You wrote that the origins of this may be older than we expect. So I guess first, for those who may not know what this actually is, tell them what Three Kings Day is, and then tell us about the discrepancy of its origins. So the Day of Epiphany, the Feast of Epiphany, is in modern parlance the day of celebration of the adoration of the Magi. We can split the Magi's uh, ritual kind of uh, cycle, if we like, into three stages of their journey following the star, their arrival and their adoration of, uh, of, of Blessed St. Mary and the, and the Christ child, and then their return via a different route. And that adoration is the scene we see most commonly. It's the, the three of them like holding out their gifts and uh, doing a, a particular kind of bowing that we'll see in, in many different models of, a, of down on one knee, the other on both feet usually, but like very hunched and about to bow, and then the third furthest away, fully standing. And this itself, this ritual posture, is referred to as proskinesis and is very important in talking about how the Magi were emulated uh, and, and, and were thus kind of taken as this pedagogical ritual set of characters who, who taught us that we should emulate them, that we should also bring gifts to God. And we can, we can talk about the, the specifics of how that ends up being a little bit eschatological, but also yeah. kind of explicitly necromantic as well, which we can maybe get into. But the notion of Epiphany is the day that they turn up and have the gifts. There are a variety of other things that have also been put onto the sixth uh, before that. For instance, even, even within early Christendom, the date of Christ's birth is also said to be the 6th of January for a very long time. It's not until at least the mass conversion by Constantine that uh, Christmas is celebrated on the 25th of December. So there's that tradition. There's a bunch of other things that are also said to have happened in, in within Christ's life on the on the sixth of January. He's said to have been baptized by by John the Baptist on that day. Uh, he's said to have been at the wedding at Cana and turned water into wine on that day. He's said to have done the uh, the feeding of the five thousand with the loaves and fishes on that day. It's also a day that second century Byzantine and um, Eastern Christians would baptize newcomers and would also bless water. And if we look back at some of the traditions that existed around the, on, on what was called the 6th of, of what would be January, it, uh, in terms of the like Byzantine feasts and uh, also possibly a, a blessing of the Nile that uh, Richard Trexler points out in his art history book, uh, The Journey of the Magi, which is very good, that all of these festivals seem to have a commonality in blessing water, uh, which is something that's also done on Epiphany with three or triple kings water, which is usually just holy water that's been blessed on Epiphany itself and is scattered around the house and the threshold and, and used as a, as a super empowered holy water for us as not just pilgrims going on a particular pilgrimage, but the idea of the, the journey of life, so to speak. Yeah, you said earlier that you mentioned the word cultai and cultus, and you have, you have an entire chapter devoted to the cult of the magi and it's not mm-hmm. something that i had ever heard of before that there is uh, they have a, a cult-like following amongst a lot of people what can you tell us about the cult of the magi then so uh, it is said that the the bones of the magi are quote discovered uh, during the siege of milan and they are raided they're looted and brought back to cologne in the 12th century they're originally housed in um, the Basilica of St. Peter, and then they moved to the, um, the Corner Dom, the, 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 the actual cathedral of Cologne itself. And very quickly, this sets up Cologne, which is already a pretty bustling, thriving you know, trading city, as one of the four major pilgrimage sites in medieval Europe. To put that in context, the other three are Rome, <laughs> where the Pope lives, Canterbury, where we have tales about people going there. Uh, because it's, it's so famous and important, and Santiago, which is still uh, a huge uh, pilgrimage site for, for, for many people. So they are quickly set up as, a, as an incredibly important element of the mythic and the, and the ritual and the theological and religious landscape of early modern Europe. And pilgrimage is not just, you know, it's not just a pious affair, it's also a thriving industry. It's why so many states and kingdoms 
wage wars over taking the relics of saints because they know this will be this isn't just a prestige thing or even a religious war thing this is a these bones will bring in you know visitors and bring in coin you know there's there's deep economic factors as well so the the cult of the of cologne has the bones of these alleged uh, three magi enshrined and there's a you know a huge deal that's made of this on on the whole of epiphany tide on the days leading up to it publishing this book this year i was originally intending to put it out on epiphany and uh you know various divination and and work with them in attempting to you know close the deal on the book was that no you you have to go and visit them you have to go and make a pilgrimage and so i i went to i went to cologne and was there for uh the for epiphany which was uh which was amazing the that i call it the shrine uh the big golden arc in which their bones are kept has a little portcullis on the front of it and they lift the portcullis a day or two before epiphany and you can see their skulls which are crowned uh looking out at you it was a particularly moving a powerful experience because uh i decided to to do a tour of all 12 of the romanish churches that are in cologne as well so that i would feel you know, get on my feet by the time it got round to, you know, six o'clock high mass. Uh, and so I, you know, I tired myself out, which is a, a walking around the city and doing, you know, pilgrimages to all 12 of these beautiful churches. And the things along the way were, were remarkable as well, uh, such as learning that the church of uh, St. Andreas there, uh, uh, St. Andrew, has the sarcophagus of Albertus Magnus in its crypt <laughs> that you can just go and visit mm-hmm. if you like. Uh, and if you're already on a on a trip to see dead magicians. And so the, the shrine is still like the major central feature of the, of the cathedral of, of Cologne. And there's, there's deep history for the place. Uh, the Romanisch Deutsches Museum has, you know, just keeps finding archaeology of people living on this, you know, near the Rhine where civilizations spring up from rivers, keeps putting back further the date at which people have settled there. And so there's, a, there's kind of a strange continuation that their bones and their name coheres their cult uh, rather than the other way around to an extent. And so there's a there's you know a whole variety of things that are found in, in the Grimoric record referring to the three kings of Cullen, as it's often spelled uh, when there's a, a lack of standardization of spelling. And also when, you know, Cologne is also Colm and so, you know, has a variety of names already because it's part of that whole Alsace-Lorraine tension going back and forth between the people that will become German and the people that will become known as French. So they're... They're a, they're a big deal. You know, the, the people are going there and they're buying and making a variety of pilgrim bottles, pilgrim badges, other kinds of souvenir and, and some other explicitly magical kit that I'm happy to talk about. Well, please do. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. Right. So one of my favorite things that's been done uh, at various cultic sites uh, since at least the 6th century are these things that get called eulogia, which are usually people going to the holy place and gathering either font water or lamp or, or lamp oil from the lamps that are burning or they gather dirt and clay from from the spot and then they are they turn these the the, the dirt and clay is uh, is pressed and is imprinted with a variety of images of the of the saint or of the you know the the, the blessed virgin mary or, or or christ or what have you and so there's a there's a we know that there was a big trade in people making these these charms these these icons these this image magic and what's so fascinating to me about them because i'm very interested in dirt sorcery in general in using dirts from particular places that have particular planetary uh, occult virtue or other kinds of um, occult virtue to them is that they would uh, make these icons out of the dirt of the of the of the space, and they would use them both as as icons as, as as magical talismans, but also they would crumble them and use them as ingredients in things. And this notion of an icon, very much like one would cast uh, an astrological sigil that could be done in metal, but was also done in wax very frequently. You could also make from clay, and you would have that as a as a as a depository of occult virtue, as this battery or this beacon that's radiating that particular you know, blessings of those, of those magi, but you could also crumble its corners and add them. And they were used, you know, adding them to the powders, to, to charm bags, and also crucially adding them to water and other libations, and then drinking in the, the power of the, of the magi through very small amounts of, of working there, of, of the, the, the earth of their, of their cult, right? Their physical place that you have journeyed to. And this, uh, this I find incredibly 
uh, interesting and, and, and powerful stuff. There are other uh, examples of working dirts and dusts, the, the, the dust of the street. Uh, the Black Dragon Grimoire has a working for uh, not tiring when walking long distances. That involves most other things, uh, rubbing your feet with olive oil that has the, the has the dust from the street uh, seeping in it, which is, you know, not terribly pleasant. I, I, I tell that to some people and they, they look a little aghast at the idea of, of, of rubbing bits of street dirt on your own feet. But <laughs> the idea of, of baking that and sieving it and reducing it to a fine powder and then adding up an oil and... I'm, I'm, I'm very into the notion of, um, of, of getting at the grounded, instantiated occult virtue of things in the world that you actually have to, like, you know, get out of our temple rooms sometimes and, and go for a walk or go and visit something or go on an adventure or a pilgrimage. Well, yeah, speaking of that, you did say, too, that for lack of a better term, that the Magi are the patron saints, I guess, of places like inns and pubs. And that's yes. reflected in like a lot of, I guess you said there were a lot of pubs that bear the name Three Kings or something similar to that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I borrow a, a phrase from um, my friend Peter Gray, who uh, has remarked that a, a pub is basically a crossroads. You know, it's, it's a crossroads with booze and a roof and even the roof is optional, you know. <laughs> and so this notion of crossroads spirits is probably something people are, you know, a little more familiar with as like a a liminal locus of power and choice and chance and change. So they're the road and they're also where the road meets another road. They're also the power of the you to actually make that journey and also to make the choices of one foot in front of the other. So they, yeah, they're patrons of inns and pubs, partly because that's where you would stay when you were going on pilgrimage. We might, you know, extend that to like hotels now, that kind of thing, hostelry. And again, there are, there are workings, there are more complicated versions of workings with, for safe travel that involve explicitly going into a pub or an inn and making offerings of bread to spirits that are found in those pubs that are named and uh, are used and, and whose names are written on the ribbons that you wrap around your legs to, to keep you, you know, strong and, and, and full of stamina and endurance to, to go long distances. So they're... Their patronage of pubs is not just an abstract. There are there are spell workings, there are oper- magical operations that rely on you going to a pub and doing particular ritual gestures and protocols. Yeah, and one of the things that I found really interesting in this book was that you said that the Magi instruct us how to pray. So, mm. uh, pray tell, Dr. Al, how do they do that? <laughs> You know, I think I alluded to earlier, there's a sense that the Magi are taken fairly quickly as exemplars of what it means to be a pious and a wise person. They are wise men, and we can learn from their wisdom by copying them, by mimesis, by this, uh, this, this mimicry. So this is done a couple ways. We have it from the earliest examples of their depiction in art, which, as far as we can tell, is funerary in nature. The sarcophaguses of early Christians and the the walls of the catacombs where early Christians are, are laid to rest are images of the Magi. And the idea is that sometimes even the, the deceased will be depicted amongst their retinue, right? That they are both literally and metaphorically following the Magi. And the idea being as the Magi made this journey, this long journey to give gifts. So to the moment of death can be mirrored as a moment of adoration of the divine and that you can give the gift of your life and your faith and your devotion. And so this is where we start to get expressly, where we start to get into the eschatology, right? Where we start to get into the soteriology of what happens after you die stuff, right? And how you follow the Magi and thus are. Death becomes less that matter of judging you whether you were good or not, and more a moment of being able to to, to, to offer the gift of yourself, if you like. Uh, so we, we have that dimension of them. Then we have the, the, the concept of proskinesis, again, the idea of kneeling, and of a specific way of kneeling, and that this becomes another kind of mimesis, that we act like the Magi. And into the medieval period, as we talked about, we have this notion of starting to dress as the Magi. So there's an early tradition of painters putting their patrons into scenes, uh, into historical and biblical scenes, right? That's an established tradition. You know, it's like a, it's like a Stanley cameo in a, in, in, a, in a Marvel movie, right? You put in the name of the Lord that paid for you to paint this picture for them in the background of the of, of the scene of Christ, like, you know, doing something in his life. This is a slightly different tradition where people start being represented, not just as like in the retinue of the Magi, but as the Magi. 
And this has a couple of uh, results. One is that certain kings start to depict their sons with them as the younger magi and themselves as the middle-aged or even older, and then their dead fathers as the older magi, right? So we start to see a literal ancestralizing of this thing occurring. There are confraternities in uh, Florence who famously had the young had the sons dress up as their fathers dressed as the magi. These levels of, uh, of ancestral power and a ritual act of ancestralizing the, the magi themselves starts to have this component of not just how to pray, how to give gifts and things, but also how to embody the wisdom of the magi. You know, we see this as well in in forms of dressing up as the magi and, and otherwise these forms of, uh, of imitation and of, of king masking and of mimicry, right, of mimesis. It's almost as if invoking them is like cooked into their sort of nature and use. Yeah, that's what I was getting at too with my question about the composite character because i don't know for some reason it's strangely compelling to me that that the three kings could possibly just be the same person the same man i guess at three different stages of his life right so yeah you you have there the we could go all like you know time traveling about it but it, yeah exactly it's it's making you aware it's a memento mori it's making you aware that you know death is coming and you should be training to be a good ancestor and also an awareness of like the, the next generation is also coming. And what are, you, what are you leaving to them? Again, training to be a good ancestor. So that awareness of time doesn't just have to be a personal mortality thing. It can be a way of understanding, of framing in a, in a human way of, uh, of understanding inhumanly long periods of time, both before us and after us. So that's one of the, the useful components for me of that kind of stuff. But yeah, I love that idea of, yeah, it could be, it could be the same guy in, at three different points in life. Yeah. For sure, man. And we have to talk about the gold now because... This was something in the book that might have been my favorite part of it. We know that the Magi were set to possess gold. We know that from one of the gifts they gave to the Christ child along with the uh, frankincense and the myrrh. But the gold, Mm -hmm. according to what you wrote here, was not apparently not just any gold. It was considered the gold of Eden. What is that exactly? Right. So there's a superhero origin story for the gold itself. Right now, gold is already understood as symbolizing eternal kingship or devotion, or even love, or a variety of like, you know, uh, solar mysteries, right, being a being the main metal of the, the sun and so on. But the, the there's a superhero origin story for the, for the gold itself, which is said to be the gold that Adam first wrought out of the earth. So what that is there is talking about prelapsarian gold, right? So it's not just, you know, your standard potable panacea right you're you know the gold as the as the universal medicine that cures all things the incorruptible gold it's the incorruptible gold before the world were even fell right before ma- the, the fall of man right before the exile from eden so it is especially sacred and the idea is that it crops up in various points of important history so it starts to get this backstory of, uh, of turning up abraham is said to have owned it alexander the great is said to have owned it i'm happy to go into the Alexandrian stuff, which is very interesting. And he crops up as, a, as another magi, that is a, as another dead magician that is appealed to in, say, some of the, the litanies in Folga VB 26, which is published as the Book of Oberon, you know, in the list of, of dead magicians, you know, not just Solomon, not just Cyprian, but also Aristotle and Alexander are appealed to as well. And crucially, it's then owned by the magi as well. And moving forward, there are, there are whole stories about what happens to the gold after it's given. Mary uses it to buy some things according to these like extra hagiographies that start to do a kind of like, and I mean this in the most respectful way, a kind of like fandom building out of the story of what happened next with them, of their sequels, if you like. And uh, eventually it's said to have been handed over to some Romans that used it to pay Judas uh, his 30 pieces of silver. And these 14th century and onward hagiographies have to do this retconning where they say silver was mistranslated and it's actually gold. Uh, And it's the gold that also seals the fate of Christ. And so these are ways of bringing it back to, you know, this momentous moment of history where this gold surfaces again. So it's doing a important great moments in history via a material source that is itself something spiritual and incorruptible. So I think there's there's, there's a great deal there to get at. But I I especially love the idea that it's the gold of of Adam as a, my work with with dead magicians, mythic and, and historical, has has ultimately led me back to you know being very interested in what Adam was said to have done as the first magician, uh, and not just from a kind of Adam Cadmon perfect man that we can hopefully um, return 
to our, our prelapsarian state, but you know, literally as a patron of a variety of things. Uh, as, as, as some people may know, I have a, a deep practice in, in, in geomancy, and amongst other things, Adam is said to have been the first man to receive geomancy from the angel Gabriel. And so he is the, he's the first patron of geomancers, if we want to put it like that. So yeah, I'm very interested in that Adamic layer of, of something that connects up the very, very old and the first to the latest you know, chapter at that point of, um, of the emergent Christendom. And it's a way of like justifying you know, that this is the new order kind of thing as well. Well, in addition to the gold, you know, I, I mentioned the frankincense and the myrrh, and I think the gold is pretty obvious from a, like a symbolic what that refers to. But what would the frankincense and the myrrh symbolically represent here? There's been a bunch of options uh, about what, uh, what they might represent. One of the best sources for what people thought they represented is the, the Golden Legend, which if, uh, if, if listeners aren't familiar with, is, is one of the, the really important works of, of hagiography of, of the saint stories and the kind of not exactly like disapproved of by the church, but like all of the extra stuff, all of the apocryphal stuff, all of the like folklore, if we like, of, of particular saints and things. And the, the Golden Legend has a, has a whole thing about the, has a pif, about Epiphany and the three major and what their gifts represent. And they, they give a variety of angles. They give a very practical angle on what the gifts represented, as well as talking about what they meant in terms of the character of the, of the Messiah, what they represented as, again, as teaching, as tutelary examples of like what we should be offering as, you know, pious and wise people. So the practical one that they that they offer is that, that it's said that they give gold to the you know the Holy Virgin because they're poor, right? So it's literally like these practical things. They give frankincense because the the stable smells. They give myrrh because it's a, a tool for driving out worms from the limbs of infants, right? So it has it's explicitly just like really practical stuff. But then of course they're also considered in light of the of the figure of of, of Christ himself, and so the idea is the gold is offered for tribute, the incense for the sacrifice and myrrh for the burial of the dead. And it said that those three gifts corresponded to the Messiah's royal power, their divine majesty, and their human mortality, which is obviously a huge Christological issue of you know how someone can be divine and also not, and also both. There are other examples. The tutelary exemplars, as I said, are that gold symbolizes love, incense symbolizes prayer, and myrrh symbolizes the mortification of the flesh, and that it was said that we should offer all three of these things unto God, right? And then the attributes of, 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 of Jesus himself, right? The, the precious divinity, the devout soul, and the uncorruptible flesh. So from a way away, there's, there's traditions. And that's not even getting into the Renaissance traditions that start to get a lot more astrological about what the gifts are about and what the kings are about. But there's a, there's a rich tradition of people writing about the Magi and using these mysteries of the gifts to explore these three-part maps of, of what's going on and what the underlying spiritual meaning is. So I would almost say that it, it seems most writers and, and, and magicians who uh, engage with the major usually come up with their own kinds of takes on, on what they're doing with these, you know, these three gifts. Well, one of those Renaissance era writers that was talking about them was Marsilio Ficino. Uh, he's a name that's popped up on the show a few times. He's an interesting cat for sure. And yeah. he uh, yeah. he unsurprisingly had a more occult view of the Magi. How did Ficino view the three kings here? And maybe more appropriately, how did he view their gifts as well? He starts to get pretty planetary about it. And um, some of those might seem a little unusual for, you know, modern magicians who, who you know, work with planetary energies and, and spirits. But uh, it's it's Ficino that says that the they represent, how does he put it? So the gold is a solar substance. And he says, you know, this represents Christ's kingship. That, that fits very neatly with a, a model of what the sun is about. The frankincense is said to belong to Venus, which is a might at first glance be a bit unexpected. We, we often think about frankincense as also being very solar. But uh, if we go through, say, Agrippa like in his three books, pretty much all the planets have a stake in frankincense. And here again is this idea of the Renaissance and prior to that, that, you know, not everything is made of only one planet, that many planets can go into to rule, you know, a particular stone or herb or incense. Right. So the, the frankincense is said to be a uh, Venusian and like, betoken uh, his divine grace and priesthood. Right? And then the myrrh is said to share in the jovial life that knows no decay, indicating his immortal godhead, which, again, many of us will think about myrrh as more of a Saturnine kind of 
uh, resin and, 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 and materia, but it, in its incorruptibility, it also has the, in the shadow of the greater malefic is the greater benefit, right? So we also have that jovial thing going on. So from that, you have the, the three benefic planets, well, the two benefics and the luminary. And so this gives this specifically triplanetary kind of, one might almost say kind of conjunction of these, these planetary virtues that come together and do this thing. So what do you personally make of that sort of transition during the Renaissance and viewing the Magi and this event from a more astrological perspective, you know, because you wrote in the book about how Ficino was talking about the comet and uh, the Magi knew that that was a favorable omen. And there's many other astrological examples, of course. But what do you personally make of that transition from the historical view of the Magi into that more planetary astrological view? Do you think that that, that was an appropriate transition? I do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, gosh, it's it's a dangerous thing when you start asking historians for their, you know, when they think that should have happened or not. <laughs> but uh, no, it, 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 it definitely is part of a wider Renaissance project to recuperate a variety of Hebrew patriarchs and also favored, not to put too fine a point on it, pagan philosophers, right, that they, they get to be recuperated, whether by Christ's harrowing of hell when he, you know, goes down and saves his dad and also all the people who were unlucky enough to be basically good people, but born before he could bring the good word of, of Christendom to them. And so they recuperated in that sense. And so we see this along with, you know, Aristotle and Plato. We also have this notion of like, look, we have these examples of these white, of these great wise men who are instrumental in the whole origin story of our savior. So they must have a, a reason and a purpose. And there's even examples of taking that astrological element to its kind of prophesying extension and then certain writers at the time saying well the magi were you know they're able to foresee the king why wouldn't they be able to see the the coming of his of his majesty and convert by by seeing it happen in the future and and, and sort of the opposite of retroactively converting but it's it's definitely lays a foundation and a more structured praxis for at least nominally christian uh, magicians of the time to be working more planetary material and more material that you know is accused of being pagan uh, but maybe getting at a deeper truth and this is one of the other ways that renaissance occultists are kind of recuperating or otherwise sort of you know converting these 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 pagan authors that they love so much to to basically being on the same team via the notion of the Prisca theologia the idea that that god has transmitted the divine truth very early on and everyone has just taken a little piece of that, like the six blind men and the elephant. And this is a reasoning for looking for the oldest tech you can, right? Because that must be the truest to, to God's expression. Uh, and it also says that everyone is, uh, is kind of working off the same source material, right? And this is a way of justifying reading pagan philosophers in a Christian world. I found that transition pretty fascinating myself as I was reading through the book, because, I mean, obviously I didn't have the historical depth of context that you have in the book about the Magi here. And sorry for putting you on the spot with that. I know you're a historian, but I mean, come on, man. <laughs> you have to have an opinion on this on some level, hopefully. So uh, <laughs> l let me transition into something that you, you mentioned cake earlier, cakes earlier. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought there's a great section in the book about cakes. And uh, there's actually a curious phrase from the this section about cakes. Do not forget about the camels. What does that mean? <laughs> so, but, you know, I've been I've been trying to talk to people from you know a variety of different cultures who have you know something about the Magi, and again in that Latinx context, I wouldn't want to speak for, but have spoken to people about, and in the same way that one can leave the camels gifts like one would the reindeer, like Santa's reindeer, it's also apparently the case, and this is very sort of oral transmission folklore stuff. I've yet to see this written down anywhere. But there is a notion that when the kings finally meet up on the road and they're traveling together for the final leg of their journey, by the accounts that say that they were all riding camels, and there's a couple, there's one that says they're all on camels, depictions of them all on horseback. There's depictions, arguably my favorite, if not the camels, is, is where one is on a camel, one is on a horse, and one is on an elephant, which is pretty great. In the, in the versions where they're all riding camels, the idea is that these, you know, three great wise men from disparate regions are coming together and they're kind of having a symposium as they're on their way to, to visit the Magi, uh, to visit the, the Messiah, uh, or at least that, uh, that the star is leading them towards. 
And uh, while they're having this symposium, it's said that the, the camels are listening along. And so apparently, and then again, this is just uh, talking to people who say they've heard it said that, right, uh, in, in that slight kind of pre-urban myth thing, that there are supposedly traditions that the, the camels themselves passed on the knowledge of what they overheard the Magi speaking about to their descendants, and that you can ask camels for their advice on things, and that camels were made wise by being the the steeds that bore the Magi, you know, across those those deserts and and those roads. And I like this again because it emphasizes the travel, right? It emphasizes the feet, the putting one foot in front of the other, the the road, the crossroads, the meeting place, the directions, you know, and the steed feels like another thing that should be should be honored, right? And not just from a kind of Māori animal rights angle, but but just as like understanding that all kings shall bow, it is said in, in, in Psalm 72, which was taken to refer to the Magi uh, very quickly. So we do have some other examples of people finding examples of things that aren't technically the Magi, but are conceived to be a part of their wider scriptural attributions. And so this idea of not just the kings of um, the world, of, of, of humans, but also that you know, the animals bowed as well, which we see in some crash scenes, right? But that notion that the, the world of the animal and the world of human are both agreed. Again, this idea of disparate things coming together in accord following that star uh, appeals to me greatly. So uh, certainly I've, I've found through practice and confirmation through divination that using camel hair uh, and camel foot track can be useful in certain major operations. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting twist that I'd not heard of before. And one more thing about the cakes. You actually mentioned the king cake that's associated with Mardi Gras is a reference mm-hmm. to the three kings, which I was totally unaware of. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get the same kind of, so for a start, it's crown shaped, you know, donut shaped, I guess we could say. But that's kind of a, a, a circle, right? A, a, a thing that could be a crown. There are examples going back to the 12th century when a, um, a famous visionary has this uh, revelation uh, and, and in her vision she sees the three kings appearing to Christ and taking off their crowns and giving their crowns. You know, again, this this act of um, ritual uh, submission, I guess we could say. But Christ then blesses the crowns and gives them back, right? So the idea that you give a crown as a king to have that crown empowered more. And that's, the, that's that great theurgic paradox, right? That the more we submit ourselves to uh, something greater than ourselves, if we pick right, that thing actually empowers us more. And so in the in that that ebb and flow of devotion and empowerment, there's uh there's there's this beautiful tension and paradox that that generates these uh these profound experiences and these uh these changes in, in ourselves and in and in the world. So there's a strong component of giving crowns, wreaths as well are a very popular thing to give. But yes, a lot of the time the cakes are either crown shaped or they have a crown on them. And this is found in the twelfth cake in English traditions of twelfth night, where the bean or the token in one of the slices connotes the, the king and queen, who, who then have these little crowns, uh, and then to also, you know, they rule the night of the party, but they also have to, in some traditions, do stuff on Candlemas. And this is found in in French traditions in both so, uh, southern and northern gateaus of the kings, and also, yeah, most typically in the in the cake of the the kings of Mardi Gras in, uh, in in New Orleans, the the colours themselves, the Rex crew, again for kings, right? Those kings give the colours as, as purple, green, and gold, and those are said to be uh, particularly significant colours and, and reflect various things in the same way that the gifts are said to. So they're used again in these in this three part way of approaching uh, the kings and their importance. Yeah, I mean, who knew, you know, that this debaucherous event had a connection to the three kings here. <laughs> So for the uh, for the magically operant among us, there are some practical ways that you can work with the Magi. And I had a couple I wanted you to outline for us. The first being a work of healing. Tell us a bit about how we can work with the Magi for healing purposes. Sure. So there's uh, a variety of charms found all over the place. One of the healing ones uh, I'm familiar with, I include in the book, and I include some analysis of it as well, is um, from some Middle English prose stuff. The work involves writing the names of the three kings on your forehead in your own blood <laughs> from the, and blood from the little finger, crucially, which is uh, a frequent uh, grimoric trait. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, seems to reflect a chiromantic, 
correspondence of the little finger to Mercury and this idea of a, of a psychocomp and an intermediary power being the way that you make this. It's not a formal pact. It's just uh, it's a way of empowering oneself. Um, but you would write the names and you would, you know, there's a, a charm that you say. And, uh, and this is meant to preserve you, uh, amongst other things, from the falling evil and a variety of other ailments, things like that. Or you can uh, write it on a piece of paper or uh, a similar thing. And you can make textual charms from it and hang it around the neck. With this writing of their names itself becomes significant that the, the names, there are conjurations that uh, call on them that conjure by not just the names of the Magi, not just the acts of the Magi, but by the sound of their names. And so the words themselves start to take on this sort of magical formulary quality to them, this sort of uh, vocus magicae, you know, nomina barbara stuff, although we know what they mean. Um, but the, the, the very saying of their names or the writing of their names is itself uh, becomes this, this act of magic. I was curious, too, if you could also give us an example of a work of protection. Mm, sure, yeah. So uh, there are ways in which they are they protect from a variety of things. Again, these, uh, you know, we have examples of, uh, of rings being made on their, on their behalf and dedicated to them. Charms, uh, which you would write out, written charms that you would just carry on your person. And if you had them, then you would be protected from thieves or from pestilence or from thunder and lightning or, you know, not hurt by, you know, they're, they're, they're often these like, you know, the, the kind of slightly legalistic, like just lists of things that I'm protected against, Right. Uh, so that you name them specifically and are thus uh, uh, saved by them. And they, yeah, they have a, a utility to them. You know, a lot of these I found in Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, which is, you know, one of my favorite early modern works, precisely because it's it's sometimes described as the, the first English language grimoire, because it's written as a, a list of um, terrible superstitions that you absolutely shouldn't engage with. But Scott is so adamant that he wants to describe exactly how these things are done so that you can notice when other people are doing them, that the book instantly becomes a bestseller with magicians. <laughs> and so, you know, nothing spreads faster than bad news, right? There's, no, there's nothing like putting a parental advisory sticker on something to make, mm -hmm. you know, young, young magicians want to want to know what that's all about. And so the the very spread of them uh, is at the at the core of where grimoire stuff starts being written in the Vulgate English. And that's really interesting to me as well. Yeah. And what was also interesting to me was the connection that the Magi have with uh, some rather necromantic practices. You said that uh, there is indeed a powerful necromantic outsider current animating the Three Kings. You also wrote later that, for me, the Magi thus form as a necromantic locus of the spirits of what might be called in other traditions the mighty dead, ancestor magicians of many colors, creeds, and cultai. So I'm curious what you can tell us about that necromantic current with the Magi here and how it interacts with them. So this is a, a good example of what is hopefully a kind of one-two punch of the, of the research and the, and the exploration of their historical cultus, their magical record, and then also my own workings and experiences and, you know, things that are confirmed through divination and through uh, continual praxis. So we have a couple layers to which they're associated that we can, we can say that they're associated with the, with the dead. We have this notion that their earliest artwork is the earliest depictions of funerary and about helping people pass over properly. So they have this kind of psychopompic role. We literally follow them into, you know, the kingdom of heaven. Then there's a component of their ancestralizing, right? The idea of connecting up to your descendants and also your ancestors, right? So you're a, you're a link in a chain. And that idea of that long view of time for me feels, you know, about ancestral veneration and, 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 a, and a sort of folk necromancy. And then there are plenty of examples of the, of, of the uses of uh, human blood and the bones of the dead and specifically human skulls in some of the operations that are associated with them. And so they're also, you know, palpably doing things with, with necromantic materia. And it's been my experience that the, the Magi form an umbrella or a, a locus about which we can more successfully and, and, and with greater stability call, cohere and work with and consult the shades of dead magicians. And this is not just that they are spirits themselves that come forth and stand there appearing as three, you know, figures that then give instructions and things. 
as we might work other spirits, but that they are a, they're almost like a banner that you can engage with these other spirits. So I work with a lot of early modern uh, magicians, their, their, their texts and their ghosts. And a lot of them were very Christian and, 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 and not in the way that I engage with some Christian practices. And so we can still all kind of get along as, uh, as, as under the banner of the Magi, right? Because they're from disparate places and what matters is their coherence and their cooperation. And so that's, that's very helpful for cohering and stabilizing spirit contact communion and work, uh, if that makes sense. I think it does make sense. So, hey, Dr. Al, tell people where they can keep up with your work and I guess where they can also find the Book of the Magi if they're interested. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So my website is, uh, is my name, is alexandercummins.com. Uh, and on there, you can find in my publications, you can find the, the Book of the Magi, which came out through Revel or Press with the, the expert guidance and, and editing of Dr. Jennifer Zart, who is herself a, a very accomplished astrologer and teacher, as well as a, a publisher and, and editor trips and various other strings to her bow. So they can, they can find that through the website. Um, they can also find out about these class bundles, such as the, 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 the necromancy one that we've been, been talking about. And the idea of the class bundles just if people aren't familiar with that, is that it's a, a, a set of resources. It's like a little module that you can take uh, in your own time. It, it, you download them, and then there's a, usually about a two-hour lecture, and then a bunch of the supporting, the full scans of, in this case, of the early modern uh, texts that I'm referencing so that people can read them and, and, and understand the context of these operations as well. And then, you know, there's always a, a recommended reading and, a, and, and, and sort of fairly lengthy bibliographies of these things so that they can then take their their studies and practices further as well. And so there are there's a necromancy one, there's a there's a bunch of others as well about humoral theory and about cursing. There's one about cats now as well and cat magic throughout history and which was um, part of a, a payment of a, a particular agreement I'd made with some with some cat spirits. So folks can find me there. You can also email me direct at consultantsorcerer.gmail at gmail.com. And uh, if they want to, to keep up with, um, with what I'm up to in terms of putting out devotional music and, and pamphlets and, and classes and webinars and things and, and talks I'm, I'm doing on the road, and they can also sign up to my mailing list, uh, which you can find through the website as well. So we can, we can keep in touch that way. And I'm always up for, you know, having a chat about things people want to have a chat about. I, I, I enjoy having, you know, doing a lot of correspondence with, um, with colleagues and students and things. So, yeah. For sure, man. Always a pleasure to hear from you, Dr. Al, and hope to talk to you again soon. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's, uh, it's been really fun. Hallelujah! Holy shit! And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Al Cummins. Again, my apologies for any audio inconsistencies there, but holy hell, was that a fun chat. Always love it when we can rap about the Magi this time of year, and especially when we can rap about things I'd not heard about them before. I suppose that's why Al is one of the preeminent magical historians in the game today. He's putting the work in, clanging and banging, as I say whenever I go to the gym and hit the weights, which is never. I work out at home. Regardless, if you missed the Patreon extension, what the hell are you doing? We talked about necromancy. At length. I mean, if that's not worth two bucks a month, I don't know what is. We defined necromancy in theory and practice, talked a little bit about why Al does have that fetish for 17th century necromancy, and then got into death rituals and customs from the time period, sin-eating soul cakes, working with corpses and humoral theory, the tripartite soul, the relationship between necromancy and scrying, with an appearance by the one and only Dr. D himself, also rapped about ghosts in early modern England, and brought the discussion home with some practical advice for any budding necromancers out there. And a shout out to budding necromancers Jesse and David, who signed up recently to help support the show on Patreon. If you'd like to join them, if you're looking to send a little holiday love a certain someone's way, patreon.com slash oldculture will most def be your huckleberry. Anyway, I am Ryan Peverly. You were just initiated into the Oculture podcast. And before I go, allow me to leave you with a most holy message from Dr. Al and the Three Kings themselves. Be joyful in your travels, though travails they may be. Prepare for your epiphanies with an eye on both the horizon and where you have come from. Meet your fellows at a three-way crossroads and bring gifts. And a most holy message from this little king himself, always, always, always remember to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. I'm not going
cassette. 